Namaste everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is your host Kushal Mehra. All right, this is part two of our discussion. In part one, we had uh, Shrikant Talagiri and Dr. Conrad Els both together. This is part two of the continuation of the same discussion. In this part, we are going to maybe look into the different players of the debate, what everybody is saying, how it is going. So once again, uh, Dr. Els, welcome. Thanks a lot for yes, coming. Thanks. For and now uh, I'm going to put up the the next slide show, which is uh, what we're going to be talking about. And this is going to be, again, called the Aryan debate. And we start from the question itself, which is whether it is an invasion. So, Dr. Els, I give it to yes. you. Yes. Okay. So, um, in the past, this was taken as a matter of course, that if the Aryans were first not in India, and then later they were in India, it must have been a military conquest. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was moreover deemed to be confirmed when they discovered a number of corpses in the streets of Mohenjo-daro, when they said, you see, this is the doing of the Aryans. Indra, the storm god or war god of the Aryans, stands accused. You see, he's ultimately guilty of this massacre. Now, it turned out to be a mistake. These people had died because of disease. Mm -hmm. But uh, the general picture, at any rate, with or without this incident, remained that the Aryans couldn't have come there except by a military conquest. Now, in the last few years, many invasionists have become very squeamish about the military sounding term invasion. And so they insist that there was no invasion, that there was only an immigration. And uh, they have to do that because archaeology hasn't thrown up any sign of an invasion. So it, it comes in handy when you don't say invasion but immigration. It is like they immigrated under the radar. Oh, they really? left no trace, right? Mm -hmm. and, yet, and yet they changed the entire outlook of India. They changed its religion. They changed its language over... Uh, more than half a subcontinent. Mm -hmm. So they did all this after an immigration that nobody noticed. That is a bit of a tall order. And so some people within the invasionist camp ridicule this scenario. Mm -hmm. Like Bernard Sergent, writer of uh, Histoire de l'Inde, the history of India. Uh, he was the son of uh, two parents who were both active in the resistance against the Nazi occupation of France in the Second World War. And so, you see, he knew from experience that invasion is a very real phenomenon. I mean, it's also elsewhere. Why do the Americans speak English and not uh, Algonquin or Nahuatl or so? It is because there was an invasion, there was a military conquest. Mm -hmm. And so this is not so exceptional. And, you know, it's, it's quite reasonable to assume in principle that indeed there was an invasion in the sense of a military conquest. Now, strictly speaking, um, an invasion need not even mean a military conquest. I am, for instance, reminded of the French ex-president Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, who was commenting on the situation in France that you have many North African immigrants. And so he called their massive presence an invasion. Now, by that, he did not mean that there had been a military conquest by these North African immigrants. No, what he meant was immigrants adapt to the reigning culture of the country where they immigrate whereas invaders impose their own ways, their own order on the natives. And so he had the impression that more and more these North Africans were imposing their way of life mm -hmm. on the environment that they came into rather than the other way around. Now, I'm not at all holding a brief for uh, Valerie Giscard d'Estaing's position or the opposite. I'm only drawing attention to the sense in which he uses this word. So invasion need not even mean a military conquest. 
it it uh, it is not about the means used to immigrate military or other but the end you see at the end in an invasion you have a reversal of the power equation where the intruders are in power and the natives who took it for granted that they were empowered in their own country mm -hmm. suddenly find themselves uh disfavored or even oppressed and so if in the case of india the invaders managed to impose even their language i mean your mother tongue is something fairly intimate if you lose that you've been really overpowered their religion also uh, their arts and so on well you see i i think it is totally fair to speak of an invasion and indeed Many of the people who insist on calling it immigration rather than invasion, you see, if you scratch them, they turn out to be invasionists anyway. Like they draw attention to the military advantages that some of the newly brought uh, instruments of the Aryans are supposed to be, especially the horse-drawn chariots. You see, that was something new, and they construe that as the tank, as the Panzer, as Witzel calls it in German, uh, of the invading Aryans. So you see there again, wh why should they need military advantages if their conquest was so peaceful? So you see, on all hands, this can fairly be called an invasion. All right. Right, then another controversial aspect of this whole... Uh, Aryan migration or invasion is the racial element. Now, originally, the out of India theory, which was uh, in vogue in uh, about 1800, uh, was not yet uh, anti Semitic. You know, it, uh, it had nothing to do with this. Indeed, Friedrich Schlegel, who glorified India and who extolled India as the homeland was the son-in-law of the Jewish thinker Moses Mendelssohn. Mm -hmm. Moreover, at the time, there were several hypotheses that were looking for some profound link between Indo-European and Semitic. And so at that time, you see, this anti-Jewish angle was not really uh, in, in force yet. Now, as soon as the Peri-Caucasian homeland was posited by uh, August Schlegel, 1834. Then um, the mere fact of his choice of the Caucasus area contributed to the racialization of Indo-European because uh, earlier that century, Johann Blumenbach had posited the Caucasus area as the origin of the white race. Mm -hmm which is why incidentally in america till today they call whites caucasians right so uh this was i suppose innocent uh in the mind of august schlegel but nevertheless it contributed to this uh, unfortunate racialization of the notion of indo-european so Aryan was used initially as a linguistic term, as a synonym of Indo-European. It got a racial sense more and more in the 1850s, especially under the hands of Arthur de Gobineau. And uh, Aryan, Indo-European, then came to imply non-Jewish. Then in 1859, Charles Darwin became famous with his origin of species, you see, which is subtitled uh, a book of favored races, uh, mm -hmm. the way that evolution favors certain races, stronger races over others. And so from then on, the notion of racism, of biological determinism spreads like wildfire. Like the British uh, Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, who ruled the British Empire really at the height of uh, its colonialism, he said that race is the key to all of history. True. So from then on, it was very, uh, very strongly present. And so you also see this in the uh, 
Indo-European discipline, like Theodor Pöschke is the, the first one who calls the Aryans blonde and blue-eyed. And uh, Karl Penka locates the homeland in northern Germany, Denmark. Something similar is also very influential, uh, the opinion of Gustav Kossina. So from then on, you get more or less the, the notion of Aryan the way we know it from the Nazis. One consequence was that the translations of the Vedas and other literature that was then in full swing, that that gets influenced, that gets uh, approached through the lens of race. And so the Rig Veda is then read as the report of the conquest of the dark natives by the Aryan race. For example, you have in the Vedas the word anas, which can be analyzed as an as, meaning mouthless. As is the same word as Latin os, meaning mouth. Or anas, meaning noseless. And so it, it, then it was interpreted in the, in the second sense, you know, referring to oh, something you hardly see in India, but referring to Africans, for example, who are flat nosed. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you see that that sense is not there in the in the Vedas at all. Uh, Alnas means difficult uh, to comprehend. So the, the different tribes often spoke more or less the same language, but a different variety. So they expected to understand one another, yet often they didn't. The dialects had grown too far apart. <coughs> so for such situations, you have terms like Alnas. Then all words for black, which is a very common metaphor for, for enemy, are identified with native. Uh, you have, for example, in the Second World War, the uh, collaborators with the Axis powers, whether in Belgium, in France, in Britain, they were called blacks. Like in the, the security service reports about Subhas Chandra Bose, who famously collaborated with the Axis, mm -hmm. uh, he is systematically called a black, right? So this, this, this usage already existed in the Vedas. Then the word for uh, varna, color or quality, was interpreted as skin color. So since the Brahmins are associated with the color white, the, the, the locals with the color black, and the Kshatriyas, the warrior aristocracy with the color red, you know, this was seen as a description of their skin color. Whereas India has no tradition at all in this regard. The, the, the Varnas are simply the colors in the sense of the qualities, like the, the three Gunas are identified as white, red, and black. And so the qualities of human beings are likewise symbolized by colors. Then a, a very famous and very consequential case of mistranslation is the description of the Battle of the Ten Kings. This is a very important battle. It uh, took place on the banks of the Ravi River, which is currently the border, international border between India and Pakistan. So mm -hmm. you could say that 5,000 years ago, it was already the first Indo-Pak war, which the Indian side won. Uh, but at any rate, I mean, leave apart these uh, cutisms of comparing this to Indo-Pak wars. At any rate, it was a war that took place between the Vedic king Sudas and an enemy that was called Asikni Visha. Now, Visha means a tribe, a community. Asikni means black. Maybe it should raise suspicion that it is used here in the, in the feminine form, Asikni, whereas Visha is masculine. And so this already puts us on the uh, trail of an alternative translation. So the standard translation is the black people, the black tribe, Asikni meaning black. 
In reality, Asikni is the name of the next river. So after the Ravi or Parosni river where the battle takes place, to its west, the next river is called the Asikni, mm -hmm. which means the Black River. This is a very normal name for a river. Depending on its aspect, the river may be called, for example, the Yellow River in China. The Dark River or the Black River is very common, like near where I myself live. There is the Demer, which also means the Black River. Demer, you might not immediately see it, but it is the same word as the British Thames. And right. Thames, you will more easily recognize mm -hmm. because it has the same vowels, uh, the same consonants, more or less, as Sanskrit Tamas. Tamas means darkness. So the Thames the river that flows through Oxford and London, the Thames means the dark river. So this is a very normal name for a river. And similarly, Asikni, the present day Chenab, was called the Black River. Got it. And so the Asikni Visha are simply the people from the Chenab. It has nothing to do with their skin color. Anyway, for those who thought that perhaps the enemies may be the aboriginals. And so King Sudas is the, the Vedic king who is invading India. There are certain elements in the story that ought to warn them off. Uh, twice it is said that the enemies come from the West. Whereas in the Aryan invasion story, it is the Aryan invaders who come from the West. Moreover, the names of the kings and of their tribes are mentioned. Practically all of them are absolutely Iranian. There is nothing Munna about them. There is nothing Dravidian about them. There is nothing of an unknown language about them. No, they are perfectly transparent. They are Iranian words. So, Dr. Els, could, could, could this be a classic case of reading your own racial interpretations into the Rigveda? Yes, but the strange thing is that this racial interpretation still goes on. You see, mm. you find more or less the same translation in, in uh, Stephanie Jamieson's and Joel Brereton's translation in 2014. And so, I mean, if, if, if one fellow doesn't notice the identity of all the others, Iranians who are even, if skin color matters, a little bit whiter than Indians, you see, to, 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 to interpret them as black, maybe one fellow does that. But to do that when this racism is no longer the norm uh, is, is strange. You see, they are so attached to whatever is the established uh, interpretation of the Vedas that they just continue it. Or, for example, another element, the religion of the enemies is described. Now, this is clearly Zoroastrianism. It is said that they are anindra. They are without Indra. And indeed, the Zoroastrians have demonized Indra. Yeah. You see this uh, Angra Manyu. Manyu is one of the names of Indra. Angra means the same as in English, angry. Mm -hmm. But it is a pun on the name of the priests of Indra, namely the Angiras. Right? Uh, so it is also said that they are ayajnya. They mm -hmm. don't have fire sacrifice, yeah. which indeed is true of the Zoroastrians. You see, they worship the fire, but they think it is so sacred that they don't throw things into it. Neither corpses, so they don't have cremation, nor uh, sacrificial offerings. Mm -hmm. So the, the fire itself is sacred. It doesn't serve as a channel taking up burned things up to the world of the gods. And so that, that peculiarity of their religion is mentioned already. By the way, this, this shows how this proper, more literal leading, reading of the Vedas really has very important consequences for the science of religion. Today, most specialists of the Iranian religion think that maybe Zoroaster was not even a historical person. They don't know anything about the origins. Well, here we see that the, the idea of uh, 
well, so some typical Zoroastrian ideas like not throwing things into the fire mm -hmm. or like demonizing Indra date back all the way to the Battle of the Ten Kings, which was four or five thousand years ago. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very important. It has all kinds of ramifications. But so the one that interests us here is that clearly we are dealing with the Western Indo-European cousins of the Vedic tribe, namely the Iranians, and that they have just nothing to do with black skin nor with Aboriginal, mm -hmm. except insofar as the Iranians, the Vedic people, and so on, were all Aboriginal. They were native to India. Mm -hmm. All right. So in the case of, uh, so this, as we see in this slide, so I just had one question about yeah. this, the, the whole against racialization bit. Um, so you talk about genetics as replaced skull measuring yeah. with the RN gene. Uh, and its absence as proof that a Harappan corpse was Dravidian. Mm -hmm. Now, if there is an Aryan gene, then is there a Dravidian gene? <laughs> Would be the natural question, right, Dr. Els? Well, uh, it's only in journalism that this exists, as far as I know. <laughs> so uh, a few years ago, there was this fairly sensational publication of David Reich's book, mm -hmm. uh, How We Got Here, something like that and um and then there was a sort of indian popularization of it uh by tony joseph to which sri kantalagiri has then written an answer anyway so there was a lot to do about this and so the journalists picked up on it wrote about it and not always very intelligently so they called the uh, r1a the aryan gene and so they said, you know, when we are going to research the genetics of the, the Harappan area, we're looking for the Aryan gene. Which population proves to have the Aryan gene, which doesn't? And conversely, if it's not present, then we must have, uh, we must have to do with the Dravidian. So the, 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 the non-R1A is the Dravidian gene. So this is the, the modern genetics version of what in the 19th century was skull measuring. So then they made a, a difference between dolicocephalic or long skulls and brachycephalic or broad skulls mm -hmm. and long nosed and all kinds of physical properties were being measured. Races were defined uh, on that. Uh, so you see that even back in those days, people like Max Müller protested against it. They said, you see, this is a misuse of our concept of Aryan, meaning Indo-European. And so they try to racialize it, and this is ridiculous. I mean, whatever else Indians may say against Max Müller, he was with you on this. Yeah, he protested against this racialization. But still, you see, today... This racialization is being revived now in the name of genetics. Mm -hmm. So here we have Friedrich Max Müller, or Moksha Mula, as he jocularly called himself. <laughs> so Indians tend to identify Max Müller with the Aryan invasion theory, which is not entirely correct. Uh, he was the heir to an existing uh, growing tradition of Indo-European studies. He came from Germany, then uh, relocated to uh, Oxford. And his major claim in the, to fame in the West is his series, Sacred Books of the East. So he edited a number of translations of works from Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, Taoism. And so that made a very deep impact on Western culture. So from then on, poets, musicians, and so on, start to... Uh, take things over from the East. His major claim to notoriety in India is his estimate of when this invasion took place. It is not correct to say he started the idea of an invasion, but he had a major role in it in the sense that he pinpointed it to a specific date. So he estimated it at 1500 BC. 
This was not obvious, and indeed his own pupil, Moritz Winternitz, rejected it. He said, this is unrealistic. You can't cram the entire evolution from the Rig Veda down to the Buddha in merely 1,000 years. So you see, the Vedas must be like a, a thousand years earlier. So this mm -hmm. is not just the so-called Hindu nationalists who invent this. No, no. This is one of the Western scholars of uh, Indo-European who already observed this. Yet, you see, it has become the received wisdom till today. Now, Max Müller himself, when he was faced with this criticism, he accepted it. He said, yeah, well, come to think of it. You see, this to me, this seemed reasonable, this guess, but it really is only a guess. And he even said, we will never know, you see, which I think is too pessimistic. You know, knowledge progresses, and so things that we don't see any way of knowing today may become very obvious tomorrow. Uh, it is true, of course, and that is a point of criticism for Hindus, that he supported the Christianization of India, like mm -hmm. many other Orientalists, especially in England. Yet, he also sometimes praised Hindu culture. Sometimes he said, yeah, it's a, it's a finishing story. It's about time Christianity jumps in to replace it. On other occasions, he also praised it. After all, he had a very long career. It's quite... Uh, normal that he said different things about this. Mm -hmm. Right, then um, other people started to politicize the Aryan issue, like um, the British colonialists used to say, well, we have every right to be in India because what we're doing there, conquering it, is only just a repeat of what the Hindu elite itself has done, namely the Aryan invasion. Viceroy uh, Curzon, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, called this, this history rewriting the furniture of empire. It sort of makes reasonable, makes, makes it look inevitable that this conquest had to take place. Then, um, in National Socialism, they certainly uh, believed and taught the Aryan invasion theory. So the main race theorist of the regime was Hans Günther, and he took the Aryan invasion theory as the paradigm for the Nazi worldview, which is also why he oversaw its teaching in the schools. And so... Uh, I'll explain why why this is the paradigm of the Nazi worldview. But at any rate, let me say that this was the most politicized historical theory ever. See, the Aryan invasion theory is not that innocent. Maybe later, you know, maybe in the beginning and maybe at the end, it became less politicized. But so in its history, you can't deny that it has become the most politicized historical theory ever. Now, the uh, Aryan invasion camp loves to sideline the out of India camp through guilt by association. So they say, yeah, it's the Hindu nationalists and the Hindu nationalists are evil and look what they do. They want to throw all the Muslims into the Indian Ocean and, and so on and we don't want to have anything to do with them and therefore we don't want their theory of the uh, out of India movement. Well, so actually, let me repeat: the out of India theory was thought of by Europeans. Yes, was for about seventy years the dominant theory in Europe. Yeah, and uh, yes, there are reasons why Hindu nationalists have developed a certain enthusiasm for it. We will see it in a minute, uh, but. Um, Meanwhile, it is a fact that uh, if you want to do guilt by association, the case against the Aryan invasion theory is much worse. You see, so far, to my knowledge, the Hindu nationalists haven't thrown the Muslims into the Indian Ocean. You see, there are 200 million Muslims in India. 
And uh, so they're doing rather better than the Jews in Germany in 1940. Um, at any rate, if you want to do a really sulfurous guilt by association, let's try Hitler. So where did Hitler stand in this debate? Hmm. The um, Aryan invasion theory is the cornerstone of the Nazi worldview. You see, first, you have the dynamic whites who go into the country of the dark people, the brown folk, of course, because whites are dynamic, they go places, whereas these indolent brown folk, they never go anywhere. So it is their country that gets subdued by the Aryan invaders. Mm -hmm. Now, they have then to live together with these darkies, and so they wisely impose a caste apartheid. And so the caste system at that time was also interpreted in racial terms. So they thought it was a way of keeping people of different races separate. Now, if you walk in the Indian streets, you can't identify caste with race. But anyway, you see, from their study far away in, in, in Europe, some people thought that that racial scheme could easily be transposed onto the uh, caste system. And then, unfortunately, not everyone stuck to this uh, apartheid. And so they, you know, they're... They looked at these beautiful uh, ladies from the natives and they had a lot of race mixing anyway. And so the upper castes, trying to keep themselves separate from the lower castes, they mixed quite a bit anyway. They still remained superior to the lower castes, but they became inferior to their own ancestors. Mm -hmm. But fortunately for them, their cousins far away in Europe they retained their racial purity. They had no one to mix with. And so fortunately for them, a group from among those unmixed Aryans, namely the British, came all the way to India to provide good governance, you see, superior culture and so on to these, you see, mixed population that had become inferior. And that's, of course, why Hitler also supported the British Empire. You see, it's, it's very strange that in the context of World War II, people like Subhash Chandra Bose expected from Hitler's support against the British Empire, which under a specific strategic circumstances he was willing to consider, but at heart, he was totally favorable to the British Empire, mm -hmm. which, which was a perfect realization of how he saw the world with, you see, the, the Aryans ruling and the, the lower races being subdued. Now, among Hitler's own utterances about the Hindus, there were only a very few and they were all negative, uh, was a racial interpretation of the Aryan invasion theory. And here, this is worth quoting in full. We know that the Hindus in India are a people mixed from the lofty Aryan immigrants and the dark black Aboriginal population, and that this people is bearing the consequences today. For it is also the slave people of a race that almost seems like a second Jewry. And so in his case, the comparison with the Jews is not meant as a compliment. Remark also that if he followed the now popular use of immigration rather than invasion. That's fascinating. He, yes. So that, that was already fashionable in his circles. At any rate, he supported the Aryan invasion theory. Uh, now, in India, you have something similar. So it was the first one, I think, was Jyotirao Pule. A uh, product of the mission schools and a leader of the lower castes. So he started identifying the upper castes as Aryan invaders. Uh, in his view, these Aryan invaders were the bad guys. But then some others identified with the Aryans and saw them as the good guys. 
For example, you have a Sinhalese nationalism in Sri Lanka who deride the Tamils as, a, you know, flotsam, non-Aryan, and pride themselves on being Aryans. But you see, this is in the 19th century. Now fast forward, in 2015, the Congress leader Malikarjuna Karge shouted in Parliament, you Aryans, you don't belong here, you are from outside India. You see, this is this is really a, a bizarre statement. You know, when you when you look at it from outside, uh, you see most people in the world are from outside the country they are now in. Mm -hmm. In America, not only the whites, also the blacks. Now the Asian immigrants, the uh, Latin American immigrants, they're all from outside. They came into America quite recently, and yet there is an American nationalism. And, and so similarly, other countries, you see their national myth is a history of immigration or of conquest. So in India, this could have been the case too. And yet, you see, there's someone who is in all seriousness saying, you don't belong here because your ancestors 4,000 years ago didn't live here. I mean, only in India. Then... Um, a press comment on this incident said, well, the only indigenous people in India really are the Adivasis. Adivasi means original inhabitant. Now, um, the, uh, the non-Indo-Aryans are thus pitted against the Indo-Aryans. And so non-Indo-Aryans is then mostly confined to the tribal so-called Adivasis or natives. But in fact, the word Adivasi, this is proper Sanskrit, this looks like an ancient indigenous term by which the you know, ancient Sanskrit speakers already recognized that they were intruders, that the tribals were the real natives. You see, that is a pseudo-indigenous neologism. This dates from the 1920s. The missionaries started that word. And so I think it's, 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 it's a, a, a master stroke. It's an invention of genius because it is a one word disinformation campaign. I've heard Indologists, people who really ought to know better, say in all seriousness, yeah, the tribals are the natives. Yeah, after all, the word Adivasi already says so. Well, it's not so innocent that it says so. Hmm. Uh, okay. All right. So I just had one question over here about yes. the coinage of the word. And, and before we uh, get into the Hindus accepting the AIT, um, now, as far as the fault lines in India are concerned and the politicization of this theory is concerned, it's quite well known. I, I don't need to tell anybody over here or even the viewers of the part. But the one thing I did want to touch upon it uh, was that if the word was used by someone and, and if we are talking about something like who is the native person of a particular land, then how far are we willing to go? Isn't that a valid question too that we are willing to ask? Then then why not go all the way back to the Jarawa tribes or the Sentinelese? Because yeah. Yeah, other than them, who's really original? Of course. <laughs> so I, I, I just to add to your point, I mean, yeah, I, yeah. I don't understand the whole logic behind it. That, yeah, yeah. And when do you draw the line and why, why, why the anger on Let's assume for argument's sake, the Aryan invasion is real or the mm -hmm. Aryan migration yeah. is real. Okay, I take the argument. Then then it's very interesting in, in India that different people have uh, diff uh, issues with different invaders. So there is this particular kind of uh, allergy to uh, this whole Aryan invasion being weaponized. Then there is also this thing taken over on, on Muslims, the average Muslim in India. Now, the average Muslim did not come with the Mughals. Mm. <laughs> you know, they didn't come with the Mughals. Yeah. They, they've been here. Uh, they converted and now this is not a commentary on whether Islam is uh, the religion of peace or not. Or, that's not the aim. But my whole point to you is that how do you deal with such a scenario where everything gets weaponized then? Yeah, well, uh, if if common sense prevails, then it won't be weaponized. Uh, you know, like the case of the uh, Muslims, sometimes in the fatherly line, purely in the paternal line, you go back to some Arab or Turkish invader 
500 or, or 1200 years ago otherwise they're all native you see there was an army of men coming in and they took native women sometimes they raped them sometimes they took them as slaves whatever the scenario but the children resulting were already 50 percent indigenous and the grandchildren were 75 percent indigenous and so on so for all practical purposes the muslims in india are just natives and so you see to, to 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 justify the case against islam with saying oh foreign you know that is, that is silly yep I and agree. um so this is certainly true for the the r invasion scenario in fact you, are, you have many funny angles to this like some of the tribals are in fact immigrants like the nagas in nagalim in the far northeast they immigrated into India like 1,000 years ago. So even if the Aryans immigrated, they still have more title to be in India than the Nagas, right? Now, I don't deny the Nagas their right to be in India. They've been here for 1,000 years. Isn't that enough? Uh, but so you get all kinds of these uh, strange conundrums, you know, if you start to take that, that criterion seriously. So... Therefore, uh, a number of Hindu nationalist leaders like Vidi Savarkar simply accepted the Aryan invasion theory, not because they were that much in favor of it, but at that time, it seemed to be the scientific was, consensus. Yeah, that was the consensus, and why, yeah. why fight it? And so they didn't think that this posed a real problem to their nationalism. You see, again, as I said, there is an American nationalism, even though all the people who you know, uh, shout about it, you know, save for the, the one percent or so of Native Americans, they're all recent immigrants. Uh, so it is perfectly possible. So e even Savarka accepted, well, okay, maybe we come from elsewhere, but now we are Indians. And so this <laughs> making this an issue is typical for a certain part of the Aryan invasion camp not for the the nativists not for the out of india camp but so a, a large part of the Aryan invasion camp and especially in india you see connects political conclusions in the present with this theory about what happened four thousand years ago mm -hmm. but it is true of course that now hindu nationalists are happy when they hear about this uh, attack on the Aryan invasion theory. And so this attack on the Aryan invasion theory largely started again by non-Hindus. You see archeologists like, uh, for instance, Jim Sheffer from America already found that, well, we don't find anything that would confirm this invasion. Mm -hmm. And so many more uh, Indian archeologists have found that too. Um, like you have the case of Bibi Lal, uh, we will all know 101 years old. Yeah. He um, he counted for long as the lone archaeologist proving the Aryan invasion theory. Mm -hmm. You see, when I was a student, I was told, well, yeah, you see, uh, linguistics can't really prove the homeland. But we now have archaeology. Archaeology has proven this uh, homeland outside India. Now, all that that archaeological proof amounted to was a hypothesis by Bibi Lal just after his PhD uh, in the 50s uh, when he proposed that the um, painted gray ware, a specific type of pottery, that that was typical for the Aryans moving deeper into India. Now, what that amounted to was simply an application of the existing uh, Aryan invasion paradigm to the data that he had discovered. It was not proof of the Aryan invasion paradigm. It was only an application of it. And so later he, he realized this. So I have a text of him from 1980 where he starts doubting. Then in the 1990s, he is all the way on the opposite side where he says, uh, uh, 
Harappan archaeology and Vedic literature are simply two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So th this was the only archaeological proof ever of the Aryan invasion theory, and that has turned into its opposite. And so he absolutely rejects this. In fact, I myself was at an Indian archaeologist conference, maybe 2013 or so. And um, of course, you see this, all this, this archaeological talk. Frankly, I find it boring. <laughs> <laughs> so you see on my little computer, I was doing some email correspondence. And I got an email from one of the top uh, Indo-European linguists from America. And you see, he, he preached to me, you see, I mean, how come that you as an intelligent man, you see, are swayed by this silly Hindu nationalist talk about, you know, uh, out of India. And I was sitting right there in a conference where one top archaeologist after another came to say, yeah, I work in Dolavira, and no, I have seen no trace of an R invasion. And me, you see, I walk, work in Kalibangan, and we've looked in vain for a sign of this Aryan invasion, one after another. And I was sitting just next to Bibilal, who then took the floor and said, Harappan and Vedic are two sides of the same coin. See, so whereas this fellow in America was saying to me, yeah, but all academics accept the Aryan invasion. <laughs> well, not all these archaeologists. And this does not even only count for Indians. A few archaeologists in the West likewise don't believe in the Aryan invasion. So, um, nevertheless, you see, they, uh, they insist that this is all a political concoction. And so, uh, the Hindu nationalists are indeed involved. Why? Well, the Aryan invasion theory has a lot of political ramifications, not only in British imperialism, not only in national socialism, but also in India itself, where it is used by the Dravidianist separatists, uh, by the Ambedkarites, by the Christian missionaries. And so they like to react to that. And when they hear then that some scholars uh, now reject the Aryan invasion theory, yes, they flock to it. Of course. And therefore, uh, leaders for the Aryan invasion say, ah, but we don't want to have anything to do with this political use. You know, you shouldn't touch the out of, out of India theory with a barge pole because it is politically contaminated. Well, if it is, then they should even more strongly reject and avoid the Aryan invasion theory. Because that is far, far more political, Absolutely. politicized since far longer, in many more ways, in many more countries, and not by some funny little scholars in their attic, you know, in their library. No, no, by the rulers, by the British imperialists, by Hitler. And so, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing more political than that. So if you if you are too squeamish. To, to have to do with politically used theories, then you have to certainly avoid the Aryan invasion theory. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. All right, now let's get to the real debate. Yes. Well, there was a real debate briefly, mainly thanks to the um, good work of this fellow Edwin Bryant. Uh, he did a PhD on the, the Aryan invasion debate, and I mean, this was around the year 2000, when it was really hotting up. Then he, together with Laurie Patton, uh, edited a book called The Indo-Aryan Controversy, where he brought together a number of papers for or against the Aryan invasion. So there is a paper in it by Talageri, one by myself, but also one by Witzel, of course, one by uh, Bryant and by Patton uh, themselves by uh, Hans Heinrich Hock, who is also mentioned there, uh, one of the top uh, linguists. And so for the Hindus, I think it is good that they got out of their echo chamber, that they finally talked to the other side, 
rather than among themselves. Yeah, one mention, one person I definitely should also mention is uh, Sharma, S.S. Sharma, Satya Swarup Sharma. He was a linguist. He was a rare uh, linguist on the out of India side who uh, involved himself in it, who also used many of the gypsy arguments that uh, that uh, Shrikant also has been using. Um, anyway, so uh, this was a rare moment of real discussion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Witzel, of course, has been lambasted for making this discussion very personal. Uh, well, not on that occasion. You see, it was just an argumentation which, with which you may disagree, but it was a proper scholarly argumentation. Same for uh, Hans Heinrich Hock. So that, that was the, the height of the debate, but then. Um, so many Hindus stay in their echo chamber. You see, they only talk to the already convinced. And so they miss opportunities of learning. They don't learn about what the Aryan invasion theory is really saying, what motivates them. And so quite a few of them pretend that the uh, homeland debate has been won, that nobody believes in the Aryan invasion anymore. This is what was being said at the time by the late Anas Rajaram, who also made his own uh, decipherment of the Harappan script. And... Um, on the picture that you can see there, you see a, a horse with his head turned away. Um, so that's that's uh, the artist's completion of a uh, slab uh, from Harappa that was found, but that was not complete anymore. And so very probably if you complete it, it shows a bull, not a horse. But so Raja Ram said, well, this is an artist's reproduction of the depiction of a horse. Now, there's a lot of debate always about horses being present in Arapa or not. And so, you see, this, this was his own construction. His enemy said, oh, this is photoshopped. You see, this is trying to fool us. He didn't even know the technology at the time, which was still very new and not known yet in India. Um, so I think he was in good faith, only, well, he he believed what, what he wanted to see. You see, as here I quote myself, you see, I can understand that the centerfold of the playboy likes to highlight her posterior charms, <laughs> but for a horse on a Harappan seal, I think that's a strange posture. You see the fact that he's turning his head away. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not very convincing. And anyway, apart from this artist's reproduction, there is no similar uh, design. So again, you see, to, to really uh, go to town with this was silly. And that's, that's caused by the fact that they're always in their own echo chamber. Some Hindus are going to be convinced by this, are going to be impressed by it. But so outsiders like Michael Witzel, whom you see there, uh, are not convinced. And so on the, the front page of, uh, of uh, the communist fortnightly front line, uh, he was invited together with his friend Steve Farmer to, to do a complete uh, demolition job on Rajaram when they said horseplay at Harappa, which is about this particular seal. And so many outsiders who saw this article were very probably very convinced by it and thought, well, yeah, maybe the Aryan invasion theory is right after all, because these Hindus are so silly. They can, you know, they can't be right. Well, you see, my position is, yes, they, they were right, only they did a bad service to their own cause. And, uh, well, that has postponed the breakthrough to the out of, out of India scenario. 
And so this came to a head in the California textbook affair of 2006. The Board of Education in California every 10 years reviews the textbooks and adapts them and updates them. And often this is in consultation with the communities concerned, uh, you know, who, whose ancestors or so are being described in these textbooks. So the Hindus also proposed some edits, and some of them were totally uh, correct, unassailable. Like, for example, there was one picture of a mosque where the caption said Hindu temple. So that's like fairly obvious. That's a no brainer. Of course, that was corrected. But then you see there were many other things that were more controversial. Like you see, it was said that Hinduism aims for self-realization and some bhaktas, some devotionalists said, no, 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 this must be God realization. Or for instance, it was said that the uh, Vedic hymns were poems and they said, no, 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 these are scriptures. And so, well, you can discuss all that, but you see most of that was completely uh, wiped off the table by one particular edit they proposed that immediately set off alarm bells ringing. Namely, they claimed that the Aryan invasion theory is a bygone, is a past station, and that nobody believes in it anymore. Now, that's simply not true. Mm -hmm. And so Michael Witzel and Stanley Wolpert intervened, and many other scholars assigned their, uh, their position. You see, the only one I know who purposely, explicitly abstained was Fritz Stahl, the late Fritz Stahl, great Sanskritist. Um, but so among Western Indologists, this was common, you see, to denounce the Hindu nationalists starting this California textbook affair. So the Hindus lost. Then they went again to the Board of Education to replete their case. They lost again. Then they went to court, litigated over it, lost. Then they went to appeals court and lost again uh, after paying a lot of money to law lawyers. So I think that that was the, absolutely the low point of Hindu activist, activism, even though they were well-intentioned and so on, but they just showed that they didn't know the debate. So... Ever since, you see, the, uh, the Out of India case is not uh, heard anymore, is ignored, is stonewalled. Uh, even though, you see, the uh, identification with Hindu nationalism is not correct. Uh, like the, the one who made Hindu Twa into a political term, namely Vinayak Damodar Savarkar, explicitly believed in the Aryan invasion theory. He didn't know better. Right. So, you know, all that the Hindu nationalists cared about was the enormous political use of the Aryan invasion theory. And so you have examples of that. First of all, you have many Hindus who accept the Aryan invasion theory, especially Brahmins who use it to buttress their own status of superiority vis-a-vis -vis natives which is exa exactly how the British saw it, so they take that over. That's, of course, disappearing now. Um, then the low caste leader, um, Dr. Ambedekar, rejected the Aryan invasion theory. Very important to realize, because his own followers today espouse the Aryan invasion theory. Mm -hmm. uh, but so he rejected it. Then the Dravidian chauvinists, the missionaries, of course, and all their secularist patrons accept the Aryan invasion theory. I mean, for them, it is very simple. The, the Hindu nationalists are the bad guys. They don't believe in the Aryan invasion theory. Therefore, we have to militantly defend the Aryan invasion theory. Uh, then you have the phenomenon of anti-Brahminism, which also follows from the Aryan invasion theory. This is exactly the Indian version of anti-Semitism. You see all the stereotypes about Jews that existed in Europe are reproduced as stereotypes of Brahmins in India. Brahmins are bookish, 
which they are, just like the Jews are, uh, they are secretive. You see, they start conspiracies. You see, behind the scenes, they pull the threads. They don't make themselves visible. They make others visible. But behind the scene, it is they who are in control. They're also recognizable by their clothes and their hairdo. And indeed, you see, many of the anti-Brahmin cartoons that have appeared in Indian papers over the last 50 years or so are exactly the same as those you found in the Nazi paper Der Stürmer about the Jews. Well, I just have a question over here. Yes. Well, obviously, at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, my worldview is I don't understand the Jati Varna matrix mm -hmm. itself. I mean, I've been very open about uh, wanting its annihilation as a system yeah. itself. What I find very interesting is there are two sets of people in India that that like Aryan invasion. Mm -hmm. The one is the casteist set, yeah. the casteist and the upper caste, who feel a validation of their superiority complex, that we are the superior ones who came from outside and ruled these people. Mm. There are people, whether we like yeah, it or not, yeah, there are, are genuinely such people in India. I don't know where they come from, but they are there. And then there is this version that you have said, uh, which is there in the Periarites or the Dravidian yeah. chauvinists, as you have said, who are also casteists, but in an inverted way. Yeah. And they hate it because they also believe these people came from outside. But the point is that is Aryan invasion, my question is, is Aryan invasion the epitome of groupthink then? Well, that's what its political interpretation has become, yes. Of course. So, <laughs> you are what you are because your ancestors 4,000 years ago immigrated. This is some absurd kind of uh, collective sin, yeah. which is a very un-Hindu idea, mm -hmm. or a collective guilt or a false superiority based on what, like, why am I supposed to be proud of something that was done? <laughs> I've never understood this yeah. like 3,000 years ago. Or why am I supposed to feel bad or apologize for something that was done by someone else 3,000 years ago? I have never understood that. I mean, it's it, the sorcery is amazing mm -hmm. and brilliant, but uh, I just had to mention this. All right, let's get into the stonewalling. Now, what exactly yeah. are we talking about here? Well... Um, some scholars have turned against this uh, openness towards the out of India theory. You see, um, in a review of the book by Laurie Patton and uh, Erwin Bryant, Stephanie Jamieson, who is one of the top Indologists, translator of the Rig Veda, um, remarks that, you know, we shouldn't be talking to these people. Who do they think they are? They are creationists, you know, they uh, they believe in miracles, uh, you know, and they are like flat earthers. Mm -hmm. They are like all the conspiracy theorists who think that 9-11 never happened or the moon landing never happened and so on. You see, okay, you can, leave, you can give these people freedom of speech. You are not going to interfere with them. But as academics, please, you see, we should not be seen with them. Mm -hmm. And so that's really what the whole crowd since then has been doing. They have been starkly ignoring us. Uh, so um, the comparison, of course, is flatly untrue. You see, you've had several homeland theories, like in the 1990s, you had a very strong going uh, Anatolian homeland theory that was ultimately proven wrong, but it was not ridiculed as flat earth or something. Mm -hmm. It just was wrong. And so what we are saying about the Aryan invasion theory, it's not ridiculous, but it happens to be wrong. And so what she might say about India as the homeland is also that, well, I disagree. I have proof against this and it is wrong, but that's all. And so instead, you see, they, they demonize the out of India theorists. Hmm. And so uh, many of the arguments in favor of out of India are not that strange. Hmm? Like, for instance, you know, here again, we have the argument of symmetry. You see, the 
the, the, the conventional homeland lies in the middle. But you see, it is a fact that in languages with a large spread, they typically have spread from one far corner and not from the middle. So this is not, not strange, it's not eccentric, except in a literal sense. Mm -hmm. um, so after this uh, statement by Stephanie Jameson coinciding in time with the California textbook affair, uh, where Hindus did not show themselves from the most competent side, the uh, establishment has simply ignored the out of India theory. So what is the pressure against the out of India theory then? Well, there are several uh, findings by Aryan invasion theorists that turn out to support the out of India scenario. Like Joanna Nichols who, uh, from California, who has never doubted the Aryan invasion theory, nevertheless shows in detail that the linguistic features of a number of Mesopotamian languages can only be explained by the influx of a language Indo-European from the East. So from Afghanistan, and then ultimately maybe from India, that's, that's their point is not about that. But at any rate, they came from the East, they didn't come from Ukraine. And uh, so she still stands by that. But when seeing that she, Kantalagiri, used this argument precisely as, as an argument against the, the, the uh, Aryan invasion theory, then you see she, uh, she rejected that conclusion. So she, she still stood by her findings, but she insisted that this not, does not prove an Eastern homeland. The same thing uh, has been done by uh, Klaus Peter Zoller, who discovered the Proto Bangani language. You see, Bangani is some dialect in, in Kumau, I believe, foothills of the Himalaya, um, where a layer of words was discovered that proves to be Kentum, that is to say, uh, has has sound characteristics of the Western branches of the Indo-European language family, so that it supports the view that these Western languages like Celtic, like Latin, like Germanic, originally came from India. Now, there may be more convoluted, complicated ways of explaining these data, but the most... Uh, obvious, the most economical explanation is that India was the origin. So again, Klaus Peter Soller stands by his findings, yet reject the conclusion that they support the out of India theory. So I don't know what's going on in their minds. You see what is behind this. Uh, Srikant has uh, made a critique of that. So he said, you see, these are radical damage control measures because they find that in, in their circle of established uh, academics, they are being lambasted for ultimately, in spite of themselves, siding with the Hindu nationalists. Mm -hmm. and so they try to get away from that stigma by, you see what, what Talagiri calls Stalin era-like retraction of their own positions. Ah, uh, well, yeah, m maybe so. But so the pressure on scholars to conform to the Aryan invasion theory is enormous. When Sri Kantalagiri's book came out in uh, 2008, called uh, The Rigveda and the Avesta, The Final Evidence, um, I gave it to four different Indologists, who each of them promised me that they would publish a review. And none of them did. One of them, who is a friend of mine, also explained why he didn't. He said, well, you know, I cannot at first sight find fault with it, <laughs> but I can hardly write that because then everybody will say, oh, yeah, he's one of these uh, <laughs> these buffoons in the out of India camp. Well, well, well. 
So you see what happens there is not so much a political conspiracy or a racist conspiracy or something. Mm -hmm. You see, race has nothing to do with it. Take, for example, uh, um, Michael Witzel. He was a devoted, or he is a devoted pupil of uh, Paul Thieme, who's a great uh, German Indo Europeanist, but also a card carrying National Socialist. You see, a committed, convinced member of the Nazi Party. Now, I challenge anyone to find an element of racism or Nazism in Witzel's work. You see, you could, you know, accuse him through guilt by association, but effectively, he is not a Nazi. He is not a racist. Mm -hmm. So that, that really has nothing to do with it. But what does have to do with it is simply all the personal reasons that you may have for maintaining an established theory. You see, all these Indologists have written their work keeping the Aryan invasion in mind. The Aryan invasion is there in the background in a lot of places. Like, for instance, they write, uh, okay, Berhad uh, Aran uh, between brackets, 600 BC. Hmm. Now, how do they know that? You see, it's simply because of the Aryan invasion theory that the Rig Veda goes till 1200 BC and then the Atharva Veda is a bit younger and, and then the Upanishads are even younger. So, you know, they have to force fit this into the Aryan invasion exactly. chronology. And so they don't really know that, but, you know, they, they just haven't thought of any other possibility. Um, and if suddenly this all proves to be wrong, well, then their own work suddenly looks obsolete. Mm -hmm. You see, even though the point they are making about, let's say, Hindu philosophy or so, is still correct, simply the background of these data, of these Aryan invasion-friendly data, that make the whole thing look obsolete. Mm -hmm. And so very many of them have a personal reason to prefer the are in invasion theory to the out of India theory. Fair enough. So I guess it, it could also be the case of now that they are so invested in it, a lot of grants and everything else must be connected to it. So <laughs> abandoning it must not be an academically lucrative option either, in my opinion. Yeah. I guess that could be. All right, the final slide. Well, you see, what you can do about this is to finally study the real out of India theory. You see, those few who have dealt with it always make a caricature out of it. Like the book I just mentioned uh, has received a review by uh, Arnaud Fournet, French linguist, who is a, a bit bizarre, but also very good. He knows very many languages. He has some interesting theories. But, of course, he's against the out of India theory. And so this book is, uh, this book review is nothing but a litany of scatologism, saying, yeah, Talageri is an amateur and he's not part of the academe, and the book is not peer-reviewed and so on. Well, we know all that, but is it correct? You know, that's the question that the scholar should ask. Um, so, you see, this work is very important. And uh, a lot of work done by Talageri, by myself, um, becomes important in the context of Talagiri's work. And so uh, I have no problem recognizing that the one who really affected the breakthrough is uh, Shrikant Talagiri. Fair enough. So I think I just had one last question yes. to you, Doctor, for you, Dr. Els, uh, as I remove the slide. So my question before we wrap the second part of our discussion is that we, I know you you did speak about it. So if, if, if a young Hindu kid is watching this and they're trying to understand, like I've in my own way tried to, you know, do a detailed deep dive into this subject albeit not at your level or Srikansar's level, but I've tried to read your work. I've tried to read, read Srikansar's work. I've read David Anthony and many other people. Mm -hmm. I tried to read papers. I tried to collate them and then the Rig Veda. Now, what would your advice be to people like us then? 
and, and i guess we'll keep that as the last message yeah well um people who feel cold you see may indeed take a deep dive especially in the case of uh, linguistics i know that that's a tall order you see most of the european scholars those who are drawn to scholarship usually they are the ones who in school have already learned like four modern languages plus latin plus greek so you see they already have an equipment that no indian has and so it's only the most motivated people in india who are going to get to that level um on the other hand you see linguistics is not all that decisive and as you can see by talageri's uh, experience uh it is already quite possible to uh deal with a lot of types of evidence like for instance the isoglosses the changes in languages that show that they develop together rather than separately um you see he has given a few important new insights on this in spite of his complete lack of academic background um so there's a lot that can still be done even without it on the other hand i have to say i have to compliment indians you see they are more uh savvy at uh, the exact sciences and so in archaeology there's quite a bit of uh, positive evidence for the total continuity of indian culture in genetics so far i don't see much positive evidence either side but indians like like abhijit chavda like raj vedam have done a good job in refuting the genetic arguments in favor of the aryan invasion and so that's that's quite important uh, though though i have to say in both their cases that like very many indians they still politicize the issue too much they say oh yeah it's all racist and so on no that's not true you see it may have been racist in 19 i mean 1880 or 1940 but it's not racist today it's also bad diplomacy because all these western scholars will feel personally attacked mm -hmm. why are you accusing me of something which i have nothing to do with mm -hmm. um and it's also not true you see nobody doubts that the colonial age had plenty of racism nevertheless the Aryan invasion theory is not the result of racism. You see, there were certain uh, linguistic considerations that made this seem a more plausible explanation of the then existing data. Uh, so forget about the political aspect of it. The, the enemy is, of course, going to trouble you with that, still saying that, oh, it's all Hindu nationalists and so on. But just mostly forget about that aspect concentrate on the historical evidence and you will see that uh, it will end up militating against the Aryan invasion theory fair enough dr else uh, as always it was a pleasure talking to you thanks a lot uh, for uh, doing this two-part series with me uh, all right guys we'll wrap today's discussion up uh, the, the the aim for the the series that we did in two parts was to basically introduce you to a wide range of views to summarize a lot of things that have been happening now if you want to do a deep dive into this subject there are multiple ways you can do it one of the ways is by subscribing on patreon or on youtube and you get the access to a, nine books till now that have been discussed by me which includes Sri Kantalgiri's work uh, Michelle Dinino's work Danino's work then you have uh, obviously we have papers from Dr. Els uh, we have other scientific papers Vagish Narsiman and others then we have the even the pro AIT AMT stand too we have covered that too we have covered three books in JP Mallory David Anthony and Asi Palswek uh, and there are many other things that we have discussed this and we are going to start discussing the Rigveda too now. So my whole point is that if you are interested in the subject, do, do you, you know, you can you can start there. And uh, if 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 other than that, if you want to support the podcast, please subscribe to the channel, like the video. Uh, I tried my best to, you know, do deep dives into subjects. This is a subject I'm really obsessed with. So I guess I spend way too much time talking about it. <laughs> it's just a personal thing uh, I'll end today's discussion over here I'll see you guys next time until then take care bye